And my name is Chris Cullen. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for taking your time out of your day to come and see me today. Uh, before we get started, um, I have the obligatory sponsors that we'd like to thank uh, for uh, making this uh, B-Sides possible. Um, and just so you know, this is one of two slides that I have for my talk. So the last one will come up at the very end with some resources. Uh, so this will not be death by PowerPoint. And also, uh, I'm, because I'm talking about mental health, I'm not uh, a medical professional, so anything that I say is, is just a recommendation from me based on my life experience. Um, so, so uh, again, I'm Chris Cullen. Um, I'm a uh, senior technical success manager with a company called Gigamon. Um, and if you haven't heard of Gigamon, they're a, a networking and software company. Um, I work on their, their threat intelligence, or their uh, network defense uh, platform. And uh, they're gracious enough to pay for me to come to conferences to talk about mental health. So, um, I'm also, uh, I've been married for 31 years uh, to a woman who will eventually be sainted. <laughs> um, I have three adult children. Uh, my oldest works in the psychiatric ward of a hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, my middle child, my son, is an uh, Army veteran who uh, just started uh, on his cybersecurity journey uh, through uh, Western Governor's University. And uh, my youngest uh, is the content manager for uh, Black Hills Information Security. Um, and, I, and I love to name drop her like that, just because I like the cred that I get for being her dad. Um, in addition to all that, I'm an alcoholic. Um, I've been sober for four years, eight months, and four days today. Yeah. Um, and I was diagnosed five years ago with uh, severe ADHD, anxiety, and depression at the age of 48. So for the first 48 years of my life, uh, I thought I was broken. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And uh, anybody in here who's, who is neurodiverse, who, who has received a diagnosis and medication, you know what before diagnosis and after diagnosis, how life is. And before I was diagnosed, uh, life really was very difficult. And I made life very difficult for my family. Um, ADHD affects the executive function portion of the brain where organizing, planning, time management, uh, emotional control, self-control, um, uh, working memory, functions like that are degraded. Uh, and medication helps to bring those functions up. But being unmedicated, you do things that you don't know why you're doing. You just do them. Um, habitually procrastinating, uh, constantly uh, turning things in late, missing appointments. Um, and when you don't know what's wrong with you, oftentimes you'll self-medicate. And the way that I self-medicated early on in my marriage, uh, and for a number of years during that time, uh, was to do everything that I could possibly do to try to sabotage my marriage and destroy my marriage. I didn't feel that I could take care of myself, let alone a wife and three kids. And honestly, I, during those years, I didn't want that responsibility. And so I would do things that would bring us to the brink of force numerous times. But my wife, God bless her, stuck with me through all these years and um, Fortunately, that, that our marriage is stronger than it's ever been. Um, <clears throat> so once I worked that out of my system, I wasn't over trying to self-medicate. And I wasn't a big drinker. Um, maybe a, a beer at dinner out at dinner or something, but one weekend about eight years ago or something, I brought home a six-pack of beer 
put it in the fridge. And my wife opened the fridge and said, there's beer in the fridge. I'm like, yeah, I figured I'd have some in there so I mow the yard or something, I'll have a, a cold beer at the end of the day or something. She's like, okay. So that cold beer turned into two cold beers and then four cold beers and then the six pack. And after a couple of months, the beer just wasn't doing anything for me. And so I moved to box wine. And I was trying to numb, I was trying to numb this, this the pain that I felt that I didn't even know where it was coming from because I just didn't, I didn't know I was ADHD. And moved to boxed wine. And the, the nice thing about boxed wine is that you can keep buying the same box of boxed wine. If you leave it in the same spot in the fridge, no one but you knows how quickly that box of wine gets emptied. Uh, and for someone who was working their way towards alcoholism, that was a good thing. Because I, I would drink in front of my wife, but I would also drink a lot not in front of my wife. And at some point, the box one just wasn't doing it. And so I moved to whiskey and rum and, 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 and other liquors. And it got to the point to where I would come home after, after working all day. I'd get home before my wife, I'd pour myself a drink, I'd sit down on the couch, and I would watch TV all night, same spot on the couch, and I wouldn't tell her I was drinking. She didn't know I was drinking. And pretty soon, I, so that she wouldn't know I was drinking, I switched from the whiskey, which was getting expensive anyway, to vodka. And most alcoholics end up drinking the vodka because it's, it's odorless and tasteless and you can drink it anywhere and nobody knows. Uh, so eventually I ended up drinking bottom shelf vodka. And at the end, I was, I was going through basically a fifth of vodka every two days. Uh, I wasn't an angry drunk. I wasn't um, going out driving. I wasn't messing up at work. But all I was doing was sitting on the corner of the couch every day for five, six hours in the evening and just drinking away what I didn't know was wrong with me. And it got to the point to where I finally one morning, uh, weekend morning, uh, in April of 2018, uh, my wife had woken up before I did, and I went downstairs, and I knelt down in front of her, and I put my head in her lap, and, and I ugly cried for like half an hour. I just, I cried till I couldn't breathe. And when I could finally start talking, I explained to her what I'd been doing for the last couple of years. And she was shocked. She had, she had no idea. No idea. Because alcoholics get really good at hiding their drinking. Um, and, and once she thought about it for a little bit, she said, Chris, you need, you need some help. And I said, yes, I do. So I started seeing a therapist. And then I found a psychiatrist who had a psychologist who gave me a battery of tests and finally diagnosed me in 2018 with a severe ADHD, anxiety, and depression. And it took a number of months to find the right mix of, of drugs to work in my brain with all of those together. But I got to the point where I could do what, what one therapist t told me about, which, was, which is skills and pills. You take the pills so that you can get to that, your brain to that level of, of functioning where you can learn the skills from a therapist and apply those to your life. And it took me about nine months after I had that talk with my wife. I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I ended up uh, finally having my last drink in January of 2019, 2018, excuse me. Um, and The point of me bringing all this up is the fact that I was undiagnosed neurodivergent. Uh, there are a lot of people who know that there's something different in their brain. May even think, like I did, that I was that you're, that you're broken. Um, 
I read just the other day. So, so there's uh, to understand the neurodiversity, you have to understand what it's not. Um, so back in the early 90s, uh, the medical community came out with the term uh, neurotypical. And what they said was neurotypical folks, they have brain baseline of functionality right here. And everybody below that, they're not typical. They're not normal. A couple years later, neurodiversity was, was coined to mean everyone else who was not considered neurotypical, who had something that was different in their brain. Autism was the first, first one that was brought up, and then the ADHD, OCD, bipolar disorder, dyslexia. All of those conditions where your brain is different than what they consider to be the normal brain. And studies that, I, that I've read uh, have anywhere up to 25% of folks they consider to be neurodiverse, either uh, diagnosed or not. And when I started in InfoSec just four or five years ago, and I started going through all of my, my alcoholism and, and my therapy and all this, um, you know, I started thinking that Okay, now, now I know that I'm, I'm ADHD. So now I know why I'm broken. And I still thought I was broken. And it was only in the last six months or so that I realized that, that we're not broken. Our brains are not broken. There's nothing to, to, to fix. If it was broken, you could fix it. And there's nothing to fix. Our brains are just are different. And not only are they different, but I, I, I added beautifully different to my slide because there are some amazing things that folks with neurodiversity can do that those normal folks can't. And I got to thinking that there's so many people in our industry, folks that come to conferences like this, who are drawn to this type of work and who are neurodiverse, whether they know it or not. And the percentage is much higher than 25%, I believe. I think the majority of us are neurodiverse. And I've been posting on, on, on Twitter for, for the last couple of years about my drinking and about my ADHD. And I've gotten so many positive responses from folks that I decided that it's, it, it's time to start talking about it. And, and I, I put my CFP for this talk out to eight different uh, InfoSec cons, hoping one or two would pick it up. And I ended up getting uh, six that accepted it. And, and one conference actually called me up out of the blue and asked me to talk. And I realized how important this subject is. Um, the, the, the whole reason I'm talking is, not, and I'm talk, so I'm basically I'm talking to the folks who are undiagnosed, who, who, who know that there's something different about them. Neurotypical folks don't go around thinking that they're normal. They just know they are. They don't, they don't think, oh, I'm a normal guy. You know? Neurodiverse folks, we, we, we think about how different we are all the time. We have since we were little kids. And If you, if, you, if you know that there's something that's different about you, but you don't know what it is, find some help. Talk to your doctor. Um, better yet, talk to a nurse practitioner, because I've, I've heard anecdotally that, that nurse practitioners are more caring towards this type of issue than, than, than doctors are. Uh, talk to a therapist. Go online, and there's any number of different tests online that you can take that can give you an idea as to whether or not you might be heading that way, or you, you, you might be neurodiverse. Um, so the, because there are so many folks in our community uh, that are neurodiverse, and there's so many of them I think that 
are undiagnosed, I, I personally think that the drinking culture that's been in InfoSec for, for, for decades, uh, cybersecurity, hacking community, whatever you call it, that a large part of that may be due to folks self-medicating away their undiagnosed neurodiversity. And I've talked to a number of folks when I've shared on Twitter, and, and it, it's, it's starting to prove my, my, my theory correct. I mean, that there are a lot of folks that do struggle with alcohol uh, or drugs or other risky behaviors. Uh, anything to, 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 to get away from reality for a little bit uh, and get away from, from that brokenness that you feel. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to say that we're not broken. Neurodiverse folks are some of the smartest folks in the world. Um, there was a, a company that did a, a study uh, about 10 years ago or so, I can't remember the, the company, but they went out and specifically hired autistic folks, a group of autistic folks. And over the time frame that, that they worked with them, they found that the folks with autism functioned at 110 to 140% better in production than their, than their peers in the company. But the sad thing is that only about 25% of folks with autism are actually employed. And there's such a large population or, of neurodiverse folks that could add so much to so many different industries if they were given the chance. And so, in addition to us figuring out for ourselves what our own personal issues are, um, seeking help, seeking medication, seeking therapy, um, I've been seeing a therapist once a week for years now, whether I need to or not, because I usually need to. Um, in addition to, to working on ourselves, I also think it's very important for folks that are supervisors and managers to create an environment in their workspace where they talk about their own mental health issues, their own neurodiversity if, 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 if they are, um, and if they're not, that they, that they make the workplace an inviting place, an open place, a, a, a safe place for their employees that do have issues to, to talk about those, to bring them up. Um, when I interviewed with Gigamon uh, four months ago, I told every single person in the interview process that I was an alcoholic and that I was ADHD and suffered from anxiety and depression because I wanted to see what their reactions were and if that's a company I wanted to work for. Um, if they would have reacted negatively, uh, I wouldn't have wanted to work for them. Uh, but they didn't. It was quite the opposite. They were very, very, very uh, inviting about that, and very sharing about some of their own issues. And we need to create that environment uh, in our community, not just in our community, but in, in all communities, where folks aren't afraid to come out and talk to their coworkers and their supervisors about the mental health issues that they're dealing with. And it's especially important because it's, it's an invisible condition. It's not like you break your arm and you need to ask for a week off of sick leave or something. When you wake up in the morning and you know you can't function that day, to be able to call up your, or text your supervisor or whatever and say, I, I need the day off, I need a mental health day because I just can't function. For them to say, not a problem, let me know what you need. That's, that's where we should be uh, in every organization. Uh, because it's real. I mean, it's, the burnout is just ridiculous in our field. And folks need time off to take care of their minds as much as they do their bodies. And so I think it's, it's very important that, that supervisors and managers learn about neurodiversity, that they learn about the different strengths that different 
neurodiverse conditions bring with them so that they can assign folks that they know are neurodiverse to projects that meet their strengths. So they can let them work the schedule that works best for them mentally and so that they can produce even more. Um, if they're working in an office, that they allow them to wear noise canceling headphones or dim the lights above their work cubicle if they have sensory issues. Um, there's so many little things that supervisors can do to accommodate folks with neurodiverse conditions that would not only help that individual, but would actually help the, the team as a whole. And, excuse me. So, so I would challenge any managers or supervisors to, to learn about neurodiversity and about different types of, of uh, uh, neurodiverse uh, conditions and to talk to your, your team members. And just ask them, you know, it, the, you know is there anything that, that you would like to talk about related to your mental health and you'll get no judgment from me? Um, if, if somebody, I've heard of folks going to HR to get the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, you know, get the, the letter and everything to give to their supervisor so that they, if you have to do that, then you're in the wrong company. Um, it should be as simple as, as talking to your manager and, and the two of you understanding where you're at. Um, <clears throat> so, excuse me. This, this has been, uh, for me personally, this has been, a, this, I'm 53 and it's, it's been a long 53 years. Um, but I wouldn't, today, I wouldn't trade being ADHD for anything. Um, I used to hate it, but now I understand that it's just, I'm just different. And everyone else with, with a neurodiverse condition is just different. And we can take those differences and we can wallow in, you know, self-pity and drink ourselves to death and destroy our marriages. Or we can understand them more, understand the strengths that come along with them and play to those strengths. And as supervisors, we can help our folks play to their strengths. And just in conclusion, um, before I take questions, uh, in AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, we get uh, these uh, coins for a duration of, of sobriety. Um, I've got a, a four-year coin here that I carry with me uh, just to remind me every day uh, what you know my sobriety means to me. Um, and for new folks that, that join AA, uh, if they've been sober for 24 hours, they get what's called a 24-hour chip. And this can also be used to remind you that anything that requires 24, you just need 20, you just need one more day. I just need one more day to do this. Um, you know, there's a trick that we use in AA. When we want to drink, we tell ourselves, I'll have that drink tomorrow. And then tomorrow, you tell yourself, I'll have that drink tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes, and you never have that drink. So it, 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 the, the, that one day at a time mentality can be used for anything that we're struggling with. Um, and just so I, I've got a number of these if anybody wants one. Um, it's kind of my version of my a sticker that I can hand out um, just to help you get through that next 24 hours. Um, and with that, I, I just I want to thank you all for, for coming to see my talk and uh, I will take any questions that we may have. So thank you. Um, what I've done
very successful in the last couple of times I gave this talk was uh, it basically turned into a, a group discussion where other folks in the audience chimed in to other folks' questions and comments because I, I don't know every, I only know what, what I've lived, but there are other folks that have lived other experiences. Um, and so if, if anybody has any questions, please, um, and if anybody wants to jump in and, 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 and answer uh, for someone, you know, you know, that, that's great. Please. Hi, yeah, uh, I, uh, I was recently diagnosed with AHD maybe uh, two months ago, uh, and uh, it's all been a lot to learn. Um, I don't know, just it, from, from your personal experience, what have been the things, you know, besides, besides medication, besides sure. therapy, what have been the things that you have found to uh, uh, help support yourself, uh, either in like, like bad times, bad weeks, or just in general? Like, what are the, sure. any, any strategies, any tips? So one thing I've, I've done and I continue to do is, is look back over my, my past and look at things that I did. And while I, I was still me doing them and I was still responsible for doing them, it, it gave me a little bit of comfort to, to know that, you know, there was something going on up here that really helped me to do that thing. And so it allowed me to, to, to do some self-forgiveness uh, for a lot of things in the past. Um, not that it absolves you from, from doing those things, but you understand the context in which you, you did them now. Um, and it's, it's, it's a continual growth process. Like I said, when, when, I, when, I first, when I first got diagnosed, you know, I wanted the highest dose medication I could get for every, you know, every pill the doctor tried. And my doctor started off at the lowest dose. And I thought that the medication was going to fix me. But, but there's nothing to fix because there's nothing broken. So it's, 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 it's relearning the fact that you're not broken, that you just have a different brain. And, and, and that's, that was really helpful to me. So, is there anybody else that can speak to this? Or any other questions? Yes? First, thank you for your service. Thank you. Second, did you separate from the military or did you retire? Did you have access to the VA? And did you seek care through the private medical or through the VA? So I, I retired from the military um, and I didn't go through the VA uh, because I didn't know that I had an issue. Um, I just thought I was lazy. I just thought I was pr pr procrastinator. Um, once I once I started uh, seeking help, uh, I just I did it through private insurance. Uh, so, so yeah. So I, I can't really speak to what the VA does for that, but I imagine that they do have mental health care. I, I'm sure they do. So, they, they do. yeah. Yes. Congratulations. He says, if you couldn't hear, he's also four years sober and has ADHD. So I, I know a lot of InfoSec conferences uh, over the last couple of years have become very uh, sensitive to this issue and are offering um, uh, dry events um, in addition to uh, alcohol uh, provided events. Uh, so so that, is, that is something that is uh, rising to the, the, con the conscious level of, of organizers uh, of these types of uh, conventions. 
uh, what I do personally is I just, I, like my whole team that I work with, for example, they all know that I'm an alcoholic. And when we went to Vegas uh, this year to work Black Hat, uh, we stayed for DEF CON. And um, for an alcoholic in Las Vegas, you know, it's a pretty challenging environment. Um, and they were always very thoughtful and asked me if I had any problems with them drinking in front of me, which I didn't. But that last day we were there, you know, uh, defenses kind of get broken down over a few days. And, and I was feeling the urge to drink. And I simply just turned to one of my colleagues and I said, I, I really want to drink. And they said, you'll be okay. You know? And just, just talking about it to somebody, um, i found it, it takes away a lot of that urge to drink. Um, so, so not, you know, letting folks know, folks that you trust, you know, letting them know uh, that, that you are alcoholic, that you don't drink. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously not putting yourself in situations where, you know, you might have an issue. Um, but, but I think the culture is starting to sh shift a little bit in, in the emphasis community. So, I hope I answered your question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So uh, the question is, if, if, uh, if we're on a small team, how do you, what are the couple of ways to broach these issues? Yeah, and, and just to understand and improve mental health, why engineering Sure. Well, so if, if, you're, if you're a supervisor and you have uh, mental health neurodiverse con conditions, you can start by sharing that with your team. You know, that icebreaker right there where the boss is opening themselves up to being vulnerable and talking about what they struggle with. And then letting the team know that, you know, I'm here for you if you want to talk. You know, that gives them the freedom to decide to go ahead and open up the thing if they want to as well. Um, if you're not a supervisor, just uh, bringing up the, the topic you know, just, uh, and you can do this any number of different ways. You, you know, I mean, just be creative with it. You could pull up a, a, you know, a news article that says that, you know, teams with neurodiverse, you know, individuals perform at this percentage better or whatever, something to, to, to broach the topic, to bring it up um, and get the conversation going. And uh, folks might feel comfortable to start talking up after that. Um, it, it's a hard situation. Uh, a lot of folks are, are scared to bring it up. They think that they may get fired. Um, and in some companies, they do get fired uh, under false pretenses. But, um, you know, so it, it, but again, you, you wouldn't want to work for a company like that, I wouldn't think, who wouldn't support you for who you are and, and what you bring to the table. So I hope I answered the question there. Great. Thank you. Somebody, yes. So the NT response would be, uh, go get yourself a planner. <laughs> um, but those of us who are ADHD know that, that planners don't work. Um, even I, I tried working with a planner written by somebody who was ADHD who wrote it for people with ADHD and it didn't work. Um, what I've done, uh, and I worked this out with my therapist, uh, is basically if I have a project, I've, I've, I, I put it in my brain as though it's a puzzle. 
And depending on how big the project is, that's how many puzzle pieces there are. So if it's, a, if it's putting together a presentation or something, I'll call it a thousand piece puzzle. And I'll break down each section, turn that into like a hundred piece puzzle. And then I'll break down tasks and turn those into five to 10 piece puzzles. And when I sit down to do one of those tasks, I know I'm working on five or 10 puzzle pieces, not a thousand. And, and, I, and I keep that at the front of my mind, that this is only, you know, this, this is all I'm doing right now, this little tiny puzzle. I don't have to worry about the rest of it. I just worry about this. And for me personally, that's really helped to, to uh, get through some larger tasks or, or projects uh, because it, it, it puts some concreteness to each thing instead of it just being this big nebulous, you know, thing that has to get done. It's a series of, of small puzzles that, that build into the bigger puzzle. And that's just, that's, how, that's what I do. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. No, that's, yeah, absolutely. Um, being around other folks that are that are like you, um, e either in person or, or virtually, um, and I put a couple of resources up here. Um, not a lot, but um, the uh, neurodiversityhub.org. Um, it's a, it's it's a UK website, but it has a ton of information for for supervisors to understand what neurodiversity is, um, and just for, for students. And just for, for folks in general, um, psychologytoday.com uh, has a uh, find a therapist uh, tab right at the very top. And it, you, you put in your zip code and it will give you a list of vetted therapists and what their specializations are. One thing that, that, that I, I would like to mention that I'd forgotten um, during the talk was if, if, you, if you do think that there is something going on up here and you're different, make sure that you talk to a therapist or a doctor who specifically calls out the fact that they work with ADHD or autistic or neurodiverse folks. That's very important because not all, not all therapists, not all doctors understand what's going on up here with regards to neurodiversity, like those who do specialize in it. Um, so if, if you have to recommend, you know, to somebody to go talk to a therapist, make sure that, you know, that, that that's a therapist that knows what they're talking about. Um, and on Twitter, uh, the hashtag neurodiverse squad, um, if you look at that, if it's specifically for, well, it's, it's for all neurodiversity, but it's mainly ADHD that, that I focused on. Um, they have a hashtag and a community. Um, and within that community, you can ask to be part of that community. There's about 6,200 people in it. And every single tweet in that community is something to do with neurodiversity. Um, and then uh, Danny Donovan, How to ADHD, Black Girls Lost Keys, and ADHD Jesse are four folks that I follow uh, on Twitter who have fantastic uh, either artwork or, or uh, just what the way they talk just to explain how how the ADHD brain works. Um, so, but yeah, that's that, that's a great point. Yeah, to, to surround yourself with folks that, that are similar to you, uh, so that you can learn from them and and have a support system. So, thanks. Are there any more questions? 
Well, thank you very much uh, for attending my talk. I appreciate it.